the last decade has seen an increase in investigations examining how occult organizations and esoteric groups have had a significant impact upon the literary and visual arts. This surge of interest has been manifest in exhibitions, publications, and symposia such as this one. This paper explores the theosophical movement, certainly one of the most important expressions of modern alternative religiosity. I became aware of the intellectual legacy of the occult sphere as a student of art history in this university a decade ago. Since then, my research into the field has continued to deepen. My personal journey as a practitioner has enabled me to develop a personal understanding of some of the ideas promulgated by the movement. The focus of this paper explores the emergence of the Theosophical Society in Dublin and considers how some of the tenets of the movement seem to hold particularly political and spiritual promise in the context of Ireland. In discussing the cultural impact of theosophy in Ireland, I will focus in particular upon the work of George Russell, who was also known as A.E. While the category of fiction and popular entertainment will be addressed, I will also refer to A.E.'s work as a visual artist. Recourse to these artworks highlights how theosophy offered a cosmology that was easily adapted to an Irish context, in addition to looking at the impact of theosophy upon Russell's artistic and literary output, this paper also touches upon how some of the ideas propagated by the movement also shaped Russell's work with the Irish Agricultural Organisation Society. To begin, it will be necessary to provide a summary of what the Theosophical Society is and identify several key tenets of the movement. The TS, Theosophical Society, was founded in 1875 by Colonel Henry Steele Olcott, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, and William Kwan Judge. The two founding theosophical works, written or perhaps channeled by Blavatsky, are Iris Unveiled, dating from 1877, and The Secret Doctrine from 1888. The movement gained rapid success initially in Europe and America, but eventually spread as far as India, where a centre was established in Adyar, still extant. From a doctrinal point of view, the Theosophical Society was a syncretic organisation in that it fused a diverse combination of religious traditions into one cohesive system, along with a number of social causes, such as feminism and anti-militarism. Although the movement can be seen as extending from a colonial presence, it ultimately proved to have an anti-colonial impact in Ireland and India. The three objectives of the TS are to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste or colour, to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy and science, and to investigate the unexplained, unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in man. However, beyond these, theosophical doctrine is a complex web involving reincarnation, past lives, astral planes, higher consciousness and spiritual evolution, which appeals to the legions of people at the time. Many of these people were seeking spiritual guidance in a world that was being altered to an unprecedented extent by secularization and industrialization. The founders of the TS developed a hybrid of ideas borrowed from many sources. From the Upanishads, a group of Vedic texts that formed the philosophical basis of several schools of Hinduism and Indian philosophy, they took the doctrine of fundamental unknowable and characterless unity. From Sankhya, one of the six orthodox schools of classic Indian philosophy, they took the idea that spiritual advancement consists of a gradual detachment from the process of the phenomenal world. The concept of karma is central to Buddhist and Hindu thought and equally became a key tenet of theosophical thought. From yoga, theosophy took the concept that freedom of thought and spirit could be achieved through various bodily exercises. Theosophical texts also borrowed from many other writings on spirituality, philosophy and occult science that are rooted in Western traditions. Among these were works by the ancient Greek Pythagoras and Plato, Plotinus and the Roman Neoplatonist. The Renaissance occultists Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus and later Christian mystics such as Bohm and Emanuel Swedenborg. According to some, even Christ himself preached ideals similar to those continued in HPB's Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine. The TS also integrated the esoteric tenets of a number of earlier societies into their teachings, including the Kabbalists, Rosicrucian Orders, and several groups of Freemasons. Theosophy's view was that popular religions corrupted the original revelations of mankind through their emphasis on an empty ritual and excessive dogma. 
The movement advocated a more subjective approach and placed much more importance on psychic, intuitive, and mystical activity as an equally valid form of knowledge. Another aspect of the society found, many found attractive at the time was the fact that it seemed to offer a catalyst for cultural and political change. As well as having a spiritual element, it was also inextricably intertwined with the labour, national and women's movements, as we shall soon see. The Dublin Lodge of the Theosophical Society shared in the enthusiasm that accompanied the arrival of the movement throughout the rest of Europe. Its diverse philosophy attracted anyone seeking a philosophical doctrine without dogma. The Dublin Lodge was a vital locus for several prominent intellectuals in the late 19th century who sought holistic solutions to the political impasse caused by centuries of English colonisation and the oppression of the Catholic population. The genesis of the Dublin Lodge was in a small cohort of people who initially referred to themselves as the Hermetic Society. This Hermeticist student group in Dublin was not initially theosophical per se, but was rather interested in a broad spectrum of mystical as well as literary and cultural matters. In fact, the preamble to the constitution of the Hermetic Society stated that one of their main aims would be to collect a library of work on Hermetic philosophy, Brahmanism, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Christian mysticism, occult philosophy, as well as books of scientific research of particular interest that might aid them in their studies of the more obscure sides of consciousness, dreams, hallucinations and illusions. The Dublin Hermetic Society had its first meeting on the 16th of June 1885 with Yates serving as chairman and the charter for the first Dublin Lodge of the Theosophical Society was obtained by Charles Johnston in April of 1886. One factor contributing to these individuals' interest in the TS may have been a desire to express dissent from the sectarian factions that divided Irish society in the 1880s and the 90s. This is clear in the claim made in 1893 in the Irish Theosophist, a popular magazine which will be discussed in greater detail later, that the Theosophical Society is non-sectarian and has its ranks members of every denomination. Its one binding rule is universal brotherhood. It is the friend of every religion and endeavours to show the truth underlying each. Nevertheless, it should be noted that the Dublin Theosophical Society initially attracted the following as predominantly Protestant and from an Anglo-Irish background. Dublin Theosophists received guidance from and collaborated with several international Theosophists who lived in the city temporarily or visited in the 1880s. In this way, the movement introduced to Dublin a number of individuals who went on to contribute significantly to the intellectual and cultural diversity of Dublin city. One of the most renowned of these was Mohini, Ch Mohini Chatterjee, as we see in slide here, who had become closely acquainted with Madame Blavatsky while she lived in India between 1879 and 1885. A Brahmin, member of the highest scholarly and priestly caste in Hindu society and a graduate, a graduate of the University of Kolkata. Chatterjee emigrated to Europe in 1884 and for several years acted as ambassador for the Theosophical Society throughout Europe, disseminating the tenets of the movement and recruiting new students. Chatterjee's visit was a significant effect in the development of the TS in Dublin excuse me, had a significant, was a significant event in the development of the TS in Dublin. It underscores the fact that in the eyes of the international organisation, Ireland was perfectly suited to adopt this movement. The society seems to have made efforts to embrace Ireland, probably not least because aspects of the history and mythology of the country could be seen as compatible with the Asophical ideology. Furthermore, Theosophy offered its predominantly Anglo-Irish followers a means of engaging in national patriotism without affiliating with Catholicism or conservatism, which was at that time inextricably intertwined with ideas of Irish identity. No doubt there was much in his lectures and charismatic presence to appeal to youthful idealism, which was certainly in no shortage in Dublin at this time. And one young Bohemian who attended the lecture was George W. Russell, seen here, who was a 19-year-old art student at the time. The experience was undoubtedly significant for Russell and it provided a further incentive to continue a study of occult philosophy and literature, which had begun the previous year. As soon as the Dublin Lodge Charter was received, the members of the Theosophical Society set about strengthening the foundations of the organisation in the city. One of the most significant steps taken was to establish a residence where devotees lived together in a manner that would today be considered akin to that of an ashram or commune. The building is located at number three of Relight Place near St. Stephen's Green. 
Apart from the biographies of famous individuals associated with the movement, chiefly W.B. Yeats and George Russell, there is scant specific information about this community. In particular, there's little definite information regarding the people who made up the membership of the society or who resided at the household. However, from what little evidence there is, it is clear that number three, Eli Place, was a vital locus for the society and a destination for anyone in the city who sought to learn more about theosophical thought. The household provided members with a sanctuary where they could live freely and study and learn together. It was also a place where lectures were regularly held with the intention of introducing the public to the tenets of theosophy. Moreover, the house provided a space for the movement to begin producing and distributing popular pamphlets and periodicals. The first official publication of the Dublin Theosophical Society, the Irish Theosophist, the sleeve of which is seen here, was printed in 1892. The magazine was edited by Daniel N. Do Daniel N. Dunlop and was published on a monthly basis between 1892 and 1897. This magazine also, also contained short stories and poetry and is one of the few sources of direct information regarding the development of the society still available to us. To focus on George Russell, he came from an early age uh, to experience what could be described as Blakean visions. These visions continued into his teens and were a subject of conversation between himself and Yeats when they met as students as part as, at the Metropolitan School of Art. Russell believed that his visions were manifestations of the two a day Danon, seen here in slide 8. Celtic pre Christian gods with supernatural ability and of great importance to Gaelic people. They belonged to the other world and were associated with ancient Neolithic and bronze burial mounds places of communal interest for the ancestors of the Celts of Northwest Europe, who are descendants from the native Neolithic people of these lands. Their story was passed on for many centuries in oral tradition. Many of these legends were recorded in a collection of poems and texts, some dating from the 3rd century AD, and compiled in the 11th century by Christian scholars in such works as the Laura Gavola Aaron, known in English as the Book of Invasions. When Russell was introduced to and became a devotee of the TS, he began to combine his ideas regarding the Tuatha de Danon and other aspects of Irish mythology with ideas gleaned from theosophy. Russell's earliest writings were published in the Irish Theosophist, the magazine, and exemplify his attempts to fuse his ideas regarding Irish mythology with ideas gleaned from his engagement with the occult. For Russell, magic was hermetic wisdom, and the gods are extreme occultists. A corollary of this idea for Russell was the possibility that spiritual exercise might allow the modern seeker to undergo the same process and so become a god themselves. Comparative mythology during this period pointed to parallels between different Indo-European cultures and proposed that a proto-pantheon might be constructed. Russell's belief that theosophy was an ancient creed led him to try and find its doctrines in Irish mythology, and ultimately, Russell took this to mean that there was no essential difference between Irish and Indian divinities. Russell adopted Hindu mythology as a framework into which Irish elements were then introduced. This underscores how in Ireland, the Theosophical Society enabled its largely Protestant and bourgeois Anglo-Irish members to feel more connected to possible ancient roots of their land, and in some cases access and reanimate the mythology in a way that would, have, would not have been tolerated in Catholic communities. In 1894, Russell's first book of collected poems, Homeward, Songs by the Way, was published. The book is further evidence of his devotion to the theosophical idea and his idealistic hope that they could lead to a brighter future. It was an error in the printing of this book that resulted in Russell be becoming known as A.E. Russell. A.E. attempted to have printed the word Aeon, the name of an eternal entity in the pantheon of Gnosticism, but by a printer's error this was rendered A.E., a name which he then became known for. Some of the most important theosophical works produced by A.E. throughout his career were the murals of Eli Place, painted upon the walls of the household and seen in these images. Much of the symbolism contained in them has its direct source in Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine. These murals would have been seen by all those who visited the household for theosophical meetings and events, and may even have had some sort of meditational or didactic function. 
in Flowering Dusk, the autobiography of another Dublin theosophist, Ella Young. These murals are described, which Young encountered while attending his first theosophical meeting. The following excerpt provides a personal response to the murals, which were then complete, were then complete their colour still brilliant, and is a valuable, valuable portrayal of the atmosphere at meetings held, then held at the household. We entered a room to the right of the hall. It opened with folding doors to another room, and both rooms were filled with people who sat on chairs. Somebody was addressing the audience. Helen and I found a seat and sat attentive. The speaker was talking of dream consciousness, of voyages in the astral, cycles of reincarnation, of many gorgeous things that shone and revolved like worlds in that dimly lighted cosmos. From the chandelier in the first room there hung a strange pattern of triangles that seemed to form a globe, and from that again hung a serpent. While he discoursed I stared at walls and ceilings. The walls had pictures painted on them, perhaps pictures are not the word, symbolic emblems or drawings which made one think of Blake's drawings. In one place, a small human figure stood between two great beings, one blue, the other scarlet, which seemed eager to engage the attention of the man. In another place, great serpents, crowned and plumed, reared their heads. The light was dim, and the pictures moved in it like tapestries blown by the wind, now in light, now in shadow. To really appreciate Russell's paintings, it is necessary to view his work in the context in which it was made. He is one of the few visual artists in Irish history to have developed a symbolist idiom. While his work appears to be significantly influenced by that of his French contemporary, Odilon Radon, a work of which from whom it is, is here seen in slide 13, it is important to consider the type of work that we, was being produced in Ireland during Russell's time. As the 20th century developed, particular painting began to look much like this. Mother and Child by Morris McGonagall. One might compare this didactic style of painting, which became so dominant in Ireland, to socialist realism, in that it is pure propaganda. In addition to writing numerous short stories and poems and essays for the Irish Theosophist and various other magazines, Russell produced two novels. Both of these novels contain numerous references to occult ideas which Russell gleaned via his theosophical study. The first of these was The Interpreters, which was written in 1922, as Ireland descended into civil war. The book explores the idea that nations have their root in an evolutionary spiritual system. Essentially, this book consists of a platonic dialogue among several characters who are in jail, a jail cell together, awaiting their execution. Each of these characters is supposed to typify various positions in the Irish revolutionary movement. The heretic, the poet, the socialist, the historian, and the aesthete and the industrialist. Some quotes reveal the extent of A's attempts to disseminate occult ideas via his fiction. One concept in particular that permeates the interpreters is that of the evolutionary potential of man, a key aspect of theosophical thought. Russell also communicates the importance of free will in this book, albeit via dialogue between his protagonists. This piece of fiction conveys something that was un unusual for Irish fiction at the time, which was an explicit criticism of the ultra-parochial nature of post-revolution Ireland. Russell's model of a restructured society involved the harmonisation of class, the extinguishment of sectarian animosity, and a diminished political role for the Catholic Church, and entailed the fusion of occult tenets with, with a particularly Irish way of living. In a quote from this piece of fiction, Russell, speaking by one of his protagonists, further explores the notion of spiritual evolution and the utopian future this brain may bring. This evolution will result in a new awareness of resources and energies. He writes, Every energy and element in nature has intellectual guidance, and the human mind can enter into relation with the mind in nature. We are passing beyond the stage where scientist or inventor harness nature energies to a mechanism and tap them for power. We are nearing the possibility of direct intellectual control of these nature energies through a growing comprehension of their relation to the intellectual guiders. This excerpt touches upon the idea promulgated in theosophical literature that the evolution of the human race undergoes cyclical processes and that in the distant past our ancestors may well have possessed knowledge far beyond that of the 20th or 21st century. But the work of fiction that best represents A's attempts to synthesize his various ideas 
and produced a piece of popular occulture in his work dates to 1933 and is entitled The Avatars, A Futurist Fantasy. In this work, Russell sought to further his aim of introducing a wider readership to aspects of theosophical thought. Although the avatar is set in the future, its speculative content is governed not by any analysis of the course of history, but a deep longing for a world which has awoken into being. The gods who inhabit his work are inhabitants of that world. In Hindu and theosophical belief, the term avatar expresses the descent of gods to earth in bodily form, similar in some ways to Western conceptions of Christ. An avatar in Hinduism is understood as a deity walking in the world of humans for the duration of a human life. Important avatars include Krishna, Rama and Buddha. In Avatar and Incarnation, Jeffrey Parander suggests that there are 12 important characters of avatar doctrines. Among these are the suggestions that avatars are real, since they are bodily and visible. They take worldly birth as humans or other creatures. They encompass elements of both the divine and mortal, and they eventually die. More philosophically, the avatar exists as an example of character for humans and proof that a benevolent, gracious God does exist. Some avatar doings encompass historical events and personages, while others are informed by myth, as in the case of animal avatars. Implicit in the structure of Russell's book is the idea that the Irish characters or avatars return to Earth. These avatars, in turn, foreshadow possibilities for the new Irish state. To some degree, A knew that the ideas he was attempting to disseminate by his fiction were going against the increasingly conservative current of post-Civil War Ireland. As he wrote in the introduction to the novel, there never yet was a fire which did not cast dark shadows of itself. At the end of the novel, the avatars are put to death, but the teaching goes on. A. E. writes, It is this sense of the universal as spiritual being which has become common between us, that a vast tenderness enfloods us, is about us and within us. Yet below the surface of narrow tensions in Ireland, A. E. saw that we are all laying foundations in dark places, putting the rough-hewn stones together in our civilizations, hoping for the lofty edifice which will arise later and make all the work glorious. It has long been a taunt flung against theosophists that their views were not practical and a little bearing in the material world. However, like any Besant, George Russell showed that theosophy when properly understood, can be applied to all kinds of life, socially and politically. In 1897, Russell assumed the role of organiser of the Irish Agricultural Organisation Society, an association which advocated and helped to organise agricultural cooperativism. Russell later became assistant secretary, touring the Irish countryside, lecturing to farming communities on the advantages of working with their neighbours, inaugurating credit societies, agricultural societies, another such group, group. He saw this as a means of channeling the newly awakened Irish spirit into outlets which would produce the greatest good for the whole people, an opportunity to, cre an opportunity to create a, whole, a new social order by releasing the rural population from acute distress and despair that they might assimilate the intellectual and spiritual fruits of the Gaelic revival. The cooperative, the cooperative system brought together, in friendly dis brought together in friendly discussion of mutual interests, Catholics and Protestants, Sinn Feiners and Constitutionalists, Unionists and Home Rulers, giving promise that in time the bitterness prevalent throughout the years and fostered by colonial presence would become lost in the collective goals of community life. In 1905, Russell resigned as Assistant Secretary in order to take over the editorship of the Irish Homestead the agricultural cooperatively owned paper. It became in his hands an educational and cult culturally rich medium, widely known beyond the borders of Ireland. The magazine can be viewed as truly popular, as a truly popular magazine, in that it appealed to numerous audiences and provided Russell with another way to disseminate some of his theosophical ideas. Russell's paintings from this period, such as this, show how he developed his rather ethereal idiom into something more reminiscent of Millet. His paintings increasingly depicted Im images of people working together collaboratively. A stood at the centre of the Dublin literary establishment and the Irish homestead spanned the bridge, in Hubert Butler's words, between the old traditional world of Yeats and the young experimentalists and firebrands of the Republic. Russell believed that the meaningful change would come about through the actions of a small number of high, highly committed individuals who upheld ideals. 
However, as the 20th century moved on, Ireland became a very different country. While pacifism is a key tenet of theosophical thought, several individuals affiliated with the Dublin Lodge were ardent supporters of the Irish independence movement and participated in the Easter Rebellion of 1916. The compulsion to participate in what was perceived as a vital and karmically correct cause inspired individuals to play a role in the Easter Rising. The theosophical convictions of Francis Sheehy Skeffington, seen here, were manifest in his belief in civil disobedience and efforts to encourage pacifism during the 1916 Rising. Tragically, Sheehy Skeffington's pacifism led to his unlawful murder. During the Rising, he tried to organise a civil rebellion, civil civilian defence force to prevent looting. He was arrested by members of the British Army on the grounds that he was an enemy sympathiser and was shot and buried at the Portobello Army Barracks. A remained in Ireland until the early 1930s and continued to lead his hermetic group, but ultimately found the atmosphere claustrophobic and culturally barren and left disenchanted in 1935. Before leaving, A was offered a position as Senator of the Free State, but rejected it, writing that Ireland would become a nation run by louts. Although Russell was disillusioned with what Ireland had become, he remained spiritually devoted to the country. In some ways, as near as his relationship with Theosophy, the tenets of which he never rejected, despite renouncing what the movement became after various schisms occurred. Russell's aforementioned 1933 novel, The Avatars, exemplifies how he is still attempting to integrate his subjective interpretation of theosophical ideas with visionary ideas regarding what Ireland's future would be, right up until his death in 1935. In it, a spiritual transfiguration of Ireland occurred as a result of communication between humans and the avatars from another world. These avatars are mythical heroes who empower and arouse joy in those they, they encounter. They are eventually eliminated by the authorities, but their cult and their power grows by the legends and artistic records in which they are perpetuate, perpetuated. It's essential that from today's perspective, we view theosophy and the artworks, both visual and literary, and inspired, not simply as forgotten experiments or historical curiosities. Instead, the contribution made by the theosophical movement must be recognised as an important idealistic force that was particularly insignificant in the context of Ireland, where there were so few organisations of this kind, in comparison to England, for example, where the society flourished and where the Fabian society also has much interest for those drawn to the socialist perspective. The ideas propagated by the theosophical movement contributed significantly to the pool of limitless possibilities, once available to those who sought to construct utopian Ireland. The group's activities also represent a unique connection between cultural discourse, modernity, and the global networks of the British Empire and fantasiacal mysticism. For a brief but decisive period, the movement contributed directly to the formation of a cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan milieu that was all open enough to allow a very diverse group of individuals to connect. One of the most radical and culturally creative movements of their time, the Theosophists called for a new social, new social order based on principles of cooperation and creativity. In addition to acknowledging the influences of the movement on recent Irish history, we might also do well to actually engage with some of the ideas the movement was founded upon. From the perspective of the, of the 21st century, there is much that can be gained from studying and applying the ideals of fundamental altruism, a respect for all life, a holistic approach to problems, an acceptance of change and growth, an insistence on the intrinsic order and intelligibility of the cosmos a recognition of the unique value of the individual and of the spiritual foundation of the material world. Thank you.